And now going into the book-related questions. So, uh, got the book. We had one book shipped to us, so um, I'll ask the questions, but Oz can relate. Um, we both read the book. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, so first, before going into this, I honestly, um, Oz had read the book like Friday, Saturday, and I had been, I got booked <laughs> yesterday. And I was like, all right, reading um, 202 pages in one day. I sat down and I was like, nice. And I started reading. <laughs> and honestly, I couldn't put the book down. I reread paragraphs, I reread quotes, I annotated, and I, I genuinely, like, 100% serious, was hooked to this book in so one day. So happy to hear. Um, and leading into that, honestly, I think a very, a very, um, I guess, literary um, technique you used was you started with the climax, kind of like um, in the movies where you start with like a scene where you're hooked in rather than starting with exposition. And I think like a, a lot of what you see with um, Holocaust books, and I love Anne Frank's diary, no disrespect at all, but it is very, very slow. And you need a sense of maturity before you can even read that book seriously because it's the progression is, is very slow. But yours is from the very beginning while yours you're starting already with some sense of action which really serves as a as a catalyst to get the reader to re really hooked in to continue this wonderful novel um, yeah, you want to know what happens to this dude the 17 year old boy who's like who sees the end coming and who is he and how did he find himself in that terrible terrible place in that terrible terrible situation and is he going to make it out of it yeah yeah, and I think it, it like it, it had the potential of being done not well um, if it were like over intensified. But I think you really like painted a picture well. Um, it wasn't. Thank you. It wasn't too extreme, um, and yeah. Um, and then for page twenty three, um, this side, this part of the podcast will be for those um, who either want to know more or who have already read the book and just want to relate. Um. So for page 28, you quote, and who is Adolf Hitler? Uh, yeah, we'll include a timestamp. Um, and who is Adolf Hitler? So it's basically Alexander just kind of asking his parents who Adolf Hitler is during, like, the rise up of um, the Nazis. And it kind of, like, paints, like, the horror of the picture. Because, like, of course, all of the readers, I mean, most people, like, in the world know... Um, who Adolf Hitler is. So, like, kind of saying, like, who is he kind of, like just really like paints a weird perspective because you know the atrocities he's done and to, to see someone ask who he is before he does what he does kind of just like provides the basis for a horrific um, discovery. And then on the next page, 24, when you explain Kristallnacht, which is like uh, Night of the Broken Glass for our, our um, viewers, um, I think you really do that with like, with great detail. So yeah. like, I mean, I, I thought that I had to walk a fine line uh, between sort of dropping a lot of historical information and data, et cetera, because that's not the purpose of the book. The purpose is to tell an individual private story. and But, but context was so important, and you can't assume that everyone knows the important details of World War II, of uh, the events in the 1930s and in, in the Weimar Republic and the rise of the of, – of, um, the Nazi uh, party in, in Germany. So I thought that it, it made sense to, to give some of that flavor um, to make sure that everyone sort of sees are our, our on the same page as we go through the plot. Yeah, I mean, that's part of what make, makes the book really accessible, even for an audience that doesn't have that same background and uh, what's the word? Um, that oral tradition of telling the story right. of the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, and like, as we're just going through this, I really enjoy like how this book is um, the only book you can find with the page number wise, because like oftentimes, like when you have so many different books, you have different page numbers, depending on this, the page size. Um, that was the, <laughs> the issue, I guess, with Kurt, uh, Kurt Vonnegut and Slaughterhouse Fox. <laughs> That's the one, one criticism I'll have for him. Oh my God. Thank you again. This is so <laughs> great. Um, but yeah, just like basically like having it um, standard, like within um, 
like the same page for all of them. Um, I can only find one copy and I hope you continue to do that because it's really helpful that way, um, especially to relate um, and to read in general. Um, page 44, um, you explain or just touch on Adolf Eichmann. Um, could you share a little bit about him? How, how did he impact you? Um, for one, how did he impact your grandfather? And two, how did he impact you with the, with the trial? And, and years of the trial. And... So obviously the trial took place before I was born. Uh, oh, yeah. But the trial itself uh, was extremely traumatic uh, for Israel, for survivors in Israel, um, and left a, left a mark. Um, I mean, Israel is a, is a country that was founded not only by, but in, in a, to a large degree by survivors uh, that came from Europe. Obviously, there were many Jews that came from uh, North Africa and other parts of the Middle East and other parts, uh, parts of the world. Um, but the, the memory of the Holocaust is um, carved deep into the DNA of Israel and the Eichmann trial was sort of a milestone in the way that the country and the and the society in Israel uh, managed to deal with uh, with the Holocaust, with um, our chase after um, the grand architects of the final solution of, of, of the Nazi party that have escaped all over the world, South America, so, uh, Syria, in other countries, Eichmann was, um, was the main person. And I think part of sort of what um, um, really was extremely interesting to me, speaking with my grandfather about those days, is about how events unfolded in front of their eyes, how they started hearing about names like Alois Brunner, like Adolf Eichmann, like Rudolf Hess, um, like Himmler, um, as, as they were in hiding and, and sort of some rumors started coming from uh, from the East about what is happening to all these Jews that are being deported. Um, who are the people who are managing the mass um, extermination of Jews? Who are these individuals that are sending um, um, orders and resources uh, and men all over Europe to chase to chase the Jews. So as they were hiding, they knew who their um, who the people that are hunting them down. They knew their names. They heard it uh, from newspapers and uh, published in Berlin. They were uh, in, in secret talking about these these hunters that are that are hunting them. So um, hearing all these names coming from the memories and the stories about the war, linking them to the the press the press clips, the the books that I've read as a student growing up in Israel, it made it very very real. It basically from theory in books and newspapers, it brought it back to my family's personal background, um, loaded background with these individuals. Yeah. Very good. It's a very good answer. I mean, my my parents were Israel, are Israeli, um, Israeli American. I remember sometimes they talk about, wow, this they weren't born during the time of the trial itself, but it was like this huge part of recent history. Just as an entire nation, the amount of focus that was put on this traumatic part of right. almost everyone. In, yeah. Um, yeah. And jumping to page 66, um, this might not even sound like, so I, when you were writing this, you probably didn't even think twice of this. Um, you, you say like, um, just what your description of the prisoners, you say Jews wore yellow triangles, gypsy wore brown ones, homosexuals wore pink, and prisoners of war wore blue. Um, and I think like before that, the story is so unique that like you you almost like doubt it or like you, I guess you, you maybe even think like it's a different aspect of the Holocaust you hadn't known about, which is positive, but it could be um, like seen maybe like in a negative light just because like, you don't know how to relate to it because you don't know necessarily how it was. It might have been different. Um, and then just like the description of the, the people in the concentration camps, it kind of just like allows you to realize like, oh, like this, this is that, like, this is the Holocaust. This is what you read about this. This is everything. So it kind of just like pulls you back into reality um, and allows you to understand that this, although unique, is not untrue. Yes. I mean, if anything, he was... 
I mean, his descriptions were so filled with details. I mean, we have hours and hours and hours of these recordings, of these scenes, of these places, of these times. And as a child, I, I was so intrigued by the details and by the descriptions of the people around him, of the situations. Um, I mean, it, it it's it's so real it's it's unreal when you sort of understand what was actually happening but it's so real you feel as if you're actually there when it's happening and i think that that these details also help you comprehend the magnitude of the of the terribleness uh, that actually took place yeah 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 i agree yeah. And uh, moving on, I believe on page 72, there was something that we both found very interesting. Yeah. Um, so basically the quote is, I saw poor Aronson, his eyes open and lips bluish, lying down alongside two other deceased Jews. Um, so we refer to this um, in the past part of the interview, um, where he arrives first in the camp. Um, I guess you should be explaining this, but I, I really found it intriguing. So I think I am. Um, so he, he first arrives to the camp and he sees these Orthodox Jews um, praying. And it's it's very cold outside. Um, so he basically offers them room for his tent because um, his dad offers room for his tent. Because if not, they're going to freeze and die. Um, and they, they say no. Um, and actually what they say is like, God will keep me warm. Um, it's clear that they're delirious, but um, kind of... Like, so they say that, and then the next day they wake up and they go and they look and they see two deceased bodies and those happen to be the Orthodox Jews. Um, and it kind of just shows like how real and horrific this is. Like, like it's, it's not a place where you can necessarily just pray for God to, to help you survive. It's something you need to do by yourself or, or in combination. Well, either way you need it's, it's a very logical and very real thing. It, it's Even though Judaism is so spiritual, the event that happened here is very real. Um, and if you didn't take care of yourself as a human, yeah, you would die. I mean, I mean this is obviously a very serious matter, but you have this old um, Jewish joke about the man who dies and goes up to heaven and meets with God. And... Um, he's, he's, he, tells, he, he drowns and... He, um, Actually, I, I, ruined, I ruined the joke, but obviously a man, a man is drowning um, and a boat comes and asks to, to pull him out. He says, no, God is going to save me. And then another comes and, no, they're going to save me. And then they die and he comes in front of God and says, God, why didn't you save me? What do you mean? I sent you the boat. I sent you. So the, yeah. the, the, the story is obviously you need to help yourself. I mean, you have to take ownership. There is a little God in each and every one of us that basically um, we need to take the ownership and the responsibility. We can't depend on anyone, not even a God, uh, to do that for us. And again, in that specific uh, example in the book, um, you saw the difference between people who are struggling to survive and do do incredible things that they never imagined they need to do in order to survive a freezing cold night out in the cold because they couldn't fit inside uh, inside the tent, where the other people that didn't do that couldn't survive. So there was just the reality, the the cruel day to day reality of life in the camp. Yeah, yeah, and like going on that um. Uh, that cruel reality, like on page 75, um, you see this like very vivid, um, this, these are like one of the more gruesome parts, but you see one of these, like the vivid, um, and I, I don't say gruesome as if it should not be there because I think it's placed excellently um, to kind of just, again, paint the horror. Um, Cause if not, like, like it needs to be taken seriously and, and it kind of just like allows you to relate to um, Alexander's like anxiety and horror he feels throughout the, um, experience so like he says like he, i i felt his first kick hit my rib cage and all the air was sucked out of my lungs um and like after that it, it just kind of shows like the vivid imagery of of the embarrassment and, and pain the nazis tried to evoke on the jews Oz. yeah that was a tough one that was something he felt his entire life he had like damage internal organs he would go he would fly to germany and austria and switzerland and go to the biggest experts in the 60s and 70s and 80s to deal with all sorts of intestinal and, and other issues that 
originated uh, in that scene where he almost died um, and was physically abused and, and damaged, again, at 17, that these are things that influence his entire life. Yeah, and then on page 90, you know, you really reached the part of the title of the book, you know, how did this teenage boy sabotage Hitler's war machine? So I believe that's where uh, we get a good, we get a good, we get good imagery on really the sabotage that was going on. So Stephen has the book right now. Maybe he can. Yeah, yeah. So um, they essentially like, they're in this um, manufacturing facility as um, kind of just like as, as um, they're kind of slaving away in labor. Um, that's what the Germans are forcing them to do um, to, to create weapons used during World War II. Um, yeah, that's the uh, the German military industrial complex, right? They're, they're yeah. producing their, their weaponry and their airplanes and their guns and their cannons and they're using forced laborers so it could be police officers from Denmark or uh, Dutch soldiers or Russian commanders or some of the Jews that they could not deport to Auschwitz because the roads to Auschwitz the, the railroads have been bombed so they're stuck with these Jews and these gypsies and and all of these other guys and they're all now working in a factory together so in what world in what universe can a 17 year old Jewish boy from Slovakia that collaborate and collude with a French infantry sergeant and a Russian like artillery officer uh, in, in sort of running a, um, a scheme to, uh, to ruin the whole production line of the German Mauser, which is the main sort of weapon used by the Wehrmacht units, by the, by the German army. So it's a, it's a very surreal, type of a situation uh, that no one could have predicted, for sure not Alexander. But he's, because of his age, because of his talents, because of his father and what his father did for the manager of the factory, he gets his prerogative of being the the person who gets a free pass to walk around the factory and sort of places him at the center of all of this. And none of this could happen without him coordinated and spreading the word and sort of becoming the person who sends messages from the head, from that like, senior Russian or Soviet um, commander. Um, and this that, that relationship between the Soviet commander and this young Jewish kid in that in that factory is, is just unique. Yeah, yeah, and I even took like a different, like that is, yeah, but I, I like took a different approach of it, um, of a different perspective. Um, I kind of viewed like, yes, that, and also like the fact that um, like, a lot of other countries use prisoners of war to create manufactured um, weapons and other other goods that are capable of like danger, I guess, violence, mass crime. Um, and I think like um, what's kind of interesting to see is that like usually the train of thought is as prisoners of war, they'll they'll just simply like um, concede obsequiently to like the forces to, to produce whatever weaponry they're forced to produce. Um, but I think because like, these aren't just prisoners of war, these aren't just um, like people who did not go to school or high school or to, to pursue the military. Th these are all types of people. And, and in Alexander's case, he's a highly educated man. So I, I think that like is, is a root for the problem that was created because they're, they're not just having prisoners of war who who are um, order followers to, to create these weapons. They're not people who are who are usually following orders. As you said, he's been his own boss and this is the time he had to have a boss, which isn't the smartest thing. You're, you're confining someone who can't be confined. And because of that, that's why this sabotage can happen. They're, they're, they're kind of putting people, they're, they're putting people who they assume will just follow directions in this factory while they're actually very overqualified and not even, maybe not even overqualified, but just like they cannot be confined. They don't follow orders. They're not just regular prisoners or soldiers. They're, they're people who think out of the box. And because of that, they're, they're just actual people. Um, it allows them to kind of use intellect to sabotage these weapons. Yes, and in many ways, as you rightfully identified, these are educated people, and they have this logical conundrum. They're, it's 1944. 
They know that the Germans are likely going to lose the war. They know that this factory is a target for Allied bombing, so they're in constant danger. Um, so they have to decide, do they risk themselves? Because if they're caught doing something like this, running away, sabotaging, they're killed on the spot. I mean, you saw some of the incidents there. So they need to make a decision of what optimizes their position, what uh, maximizes their chances of making it out alive. Is it doing nothing and just letting time go by and letting the, the, the Red Army and the Allied forces close in on, the, on that area and liberate the camp? Is it actually fighting? Is it actually doing the underground activities with the armament? So these are questions that each and every one of them had to ask themselves every day because everyone had to sort of make their own decision about what they thought was the best chance of them making it out alive. And that's also why it wasn't so clear to Alexander if he needed to follow the instructions or the requests by the other POWs to collaborate because he wasn't only risking himself, he was risking his father. Had he been caught, both of them would be shot, both of them would be killed. So these were difficult decisions to be made and he sought his father's confirmation. He he was waiting to to meet him because they were working different shifts. He wanted to get his blessing because he knew that by doing this, he's risking both of them. Uh, but both of them knew that this was the right thing to do, uh, to sort of contribute to the effort uh, to win against the, the Wehrmacht, against the Germans. And he, he took that risk. But there was a huge risk that they were taking. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yeah, just going on to that for um, the audience here. Um, basically... Um, his goal, put in his words, is, um, this is basically his view of his goal. The idea of hundreds of German soldiers storming American infantry or Russian posts only to have their rifles fail at the moment of truth was purely blissful. Um, so these, they sabotaged these weapons to, um, but they sabotaged them intelligently. It wasn't just that they broke down immediately. They had them sustain 15 rounds of fire. Um, so... They would go to target practice, shoot them, they would inspect them, shoot them, and it would only become a problem when they needed them most. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of wisdom going into that um, sabotage operation, and he learned a lot from it. I mean, during his life, and he became a successful business owner, um, I mean, he always went back to, to talk about sort of the influence that he had from the other POWs and the Russian ones. He always, he always spoke very, very highly of them. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then another thing that I think it was page 97, 98, Stephen, there was a, was a really good uh, quote in there. Yeah, yeah, this was the, uh, this was the line I had talked about before. Um, let me just get it uh, straight now. So he's referring to Gunter, um, his, essentially his boss, that he cleans his office. Um, but he kind of suffers from Stockholm Syndrome because um, he's treated so inhumanely when his boss gives him even like a newspaper or a piece mm -hmm. of a sandwich, which is simply an inalienable right. But um, because it's done in such an inhumane environment, he becomes drawn to this, this um, character. Um, and he says, um, I still couldn't figure out my feelings toward Gunther. Undoubtedly, this is the line. He was playing the field for Satan's team but I now knew for a fact that there were angels down in hell. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, imagine his predicament, right? He's like, he's in hell and he doesn't know if he lives to, I mean, lives another day or what happens in an hour. I mean, his life was worth nothing. And all of a sudden you have someone with influence, with an ability to control his and his father's fate. And he speaks to him. And he gives him a sandwich that his wife made, and he gives a newspaper to give to his father. So, I mean, all of a sudden, in this darkness, there's someone who he knew wasn't playing for his team, but someone who saw him as a human being. And he wasn't treated as a human being for the longest time. So... In that abyss, you see this ray of light, and it confuses you. Um, but, I mean... That's something that, again, he never he never forgot. It was something that you always went back to. Um, and then, Reminds you a little bit of um, of Schindler, Oscar Schindler, the yeah, industrialist. Yeah. You know, even in hell, there are certainly there are some angels. Yeah, 
yeah, excellent comparison. And yeah, and in page on page one hundred and fifteen, um, you see the extent to which German propaganda had affected all the individuals. So Alexander is able to speak excellent German, um, able to repair or and um, clean these typewriters with the ease of one even more advanced than a technician at that. So the German officer's ability to, to see someone who's able to do so much after their education is centered around the fact um, that Jewish people are, are dumb, imbeciles, cheaters, liars, incapable of actually understanding anything, just kind of shows you like the extent to which they had been um, fed misinformation. Yeah. I mean, to, for sure, to some extent. I think in, in this specific case, it's the fact that he was a 17-year-old. He was a he was a high school student at, at age who was sitting in the center of a of a huge concentration camp at sort of the that oil German machine, and is fixing these sophisticated instruments that are so important to the war efforts. Because again, the Germans are so tidy and orderly and they need these their documentation and after the bombing and during the war when they lose these mercedes typewriters yeah. it gets complicated all of a sudden they have this teenager in his magical tent that that fixes these broken these broken typewriters so they're they're highly appreciative they put aside the fact that he's jewish and needs to be annihilated because he's very instrumental and helpful uh, to them. And again, there's so many examples during the war of useful Jews uh, who were spared just because they were useful, whether they made dresses to the SS wives or whether they fixed typewriters for the for the clerks in the concentration camps. Yeah, and I, I find like um, kind of like the dichotomy between that and the German like ability to, to see past um, his Jewish culture and that of um, kind of like the racial tensions here in America. Um, like, as you can see, like, I mean, even in, in psychological studies, like Charles Spearman's um, General G, which is like basically the foundation of IQ tests, um, he, he has all this evidence talking about IQ tests and how they're equal for both genders and everything, even um, evidence that points to the racial equality of IQ tests, which is like very complicated because it's not really equal, but that's not what this is about. Um, <laughs> And even despite all that, in his conclusion, he says, despite the evidence, um, African-Americans are still mentally inferior. Um, and it just shows like, like kind of just like highlights the extent to which like racial discrimination and racism has corrupted like our country, because even despite vast documentation, which is even more substantial than that in the book or um, anywhere, um, such stereotypes and hate is still held. Yeah, but to, to that point, and you, you, you're raising a really important one, you saw the Germans like in a sort of in a cognitive dissonance in the sense that they're seeing someone who's Jewish, but they understand that his German education, whether it's language, culture, literature, by far exceeds their own. I mean, coming mm -hmm. from the upper echelon of a highly educated society in a different country, neighboring country, he was raised on the uh, in the lap of of German culture, and he speaks better German than they do, and he knows more about Heine and Goethe, and yeah. all of a sudden they yeah. look at him as okay, he's Jewish, but what is this? I, uh, what does this mean? So yeah. these are small moments that have, bear little significance on history or the story or anything, but these are powerful moments for the small people that sort of share them. Yeah, yeah, and I think like the I think education, it myself. Yeah, and like the education itself, like I think like we could apply that nowadays. Um, like just like, like the cognitive dissonance is a, is a is a great part of shaping beliefs because it's more than words can do. Actually, when you when you change your behaviors, you, your your thoughts and beliefs tend to shift in alliance with your behaviors, not the yeah. other way around. Um, so I think like as as this book exposes is exposed to more and more people, and just like kind of like um, stereotypes in general are exposed and as, as they're promoted to be exposed, um, we can kind of form a positive sense of cognitive dissonance that can tarnish any discriminative behaviors that we possess. Right. Absolutely. Um, 
And for oh. our last one, um, we have page, uh, second to last one, we have page 137. Um, it has to do with, like, this entire almost pseudo theme that we've been constantly hitting of entrepreneurialism and individualism. So Stephen would like to say it. Yeah, so um, he's actually, like, already rescued. You would think, like, he's rescued already. Like, he's liberated. The book should end, um, <laughs> which I actually want to expand upon later. Um, but the the book, like, okay, he, he's safe now. Like, he's probably just going to um, chill, eat some food, relax. And instead of that, he actually um, sells his Zeiss telescopic lenses. Um to these army men for for a bargain like if they offer five ten dollars he knows they're gonna sell he's gonna sell them but he says like no like they're very important to me just to drive the price higher it just shows how like his capitalistic outlook um kind of just like perseveres through any situation even when that situation is over um it still it still is very prevalent um and he's always thinking ahead like usually you would think once you're liberated like anything else would be better no matter where you go it's better than a concentration camp um but that's not the case he knows his goal is to go to the u.s and for that he needs u.s currency um and he needs certain things for that so his his mind is is always there yeah so he's Again, he's his father's son. He's his mother's son, his father's son. Highly entrepreneurial, extremely practical. So he knows that they're now liberated, but they're stuck in Weimar. They're stuck in northern Germany uh, with no money, with no way to go back and start looking uh, for remaining family members. Um, he knows that his father is feeble. He's sick. He may not survive, but he won't be able to support that effort in any way. And he has a lot of time in his hands. So they're all stuck in the big tent in the camp. Um, his father is no longer at risk. He needs to figure out a way to get some money in their pocket to allow them to make that trip, um, to allow them to buy some food. And there are not a lot of options around, right? There's, there's no one to take care of them and put money in their pockets. Um, morally, he's not a thief. He's not a villain. Uh, but it's the chaotic like the chaotic war environment and everyone needs to take care of themselves and he's just walking around and trying to think of ways to monetize and again he's a trader he's a trader's son and he's a trader with skills that allow him to go into rooms and doors that other people can't penetrate and he's leveraging his competitive advantages so he knows exactly what his competitive advantages are and he plays to his strengths to achieve his goals. Uh, and he, again, he's morally challenged with what he's doing because he knows it's not how he was brought up. He knows it's not who he is, but he knows that uh, challenging times call for unique uh, unique actions. And he, he's able to rationalize it to himself as something that is a one-off that he has to do in order to take himself and his father back to Bratislava to look for uh, his mom, his relatives, and he and he feels okay with it. He understands that this is something that he, he needs to do to become a one-time war profiteer. And he does it with a lot of talent and with a lot of conviction. And luckily, he has American GIs with uh, dollars in their pockets. And back then, $10 is a lot of money uh, if you sort of compile um, inflation and, and interest. So he he has now, they now have money in their pocket uh, to allow them to, to buy food and, and go back home. Yeah, yeah. I think that, yeah, Oz, were you going to say something? No, I just wanted to say, uh, I mean, that was our last one. So I, I just wanted to say overall, you know, going from the beginning of the war to the end of the war, I think we gave a thorough analysis and review this entire book oh, Steven, good luck. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah yeah and i think and guys you know where to find me if you have any other questions i would love to talk about all of this in detail i have depth that never made it to the book. Again, purposely, this book has to be accessible. Uh, and the goal is, as you said, Stephen, I want to make sure that when you pick it up, 
you sort of read it all the way to the end. Yeah. Um, and there could be sequels and there could be extensions, but this one is very, very important that it is the way it is. Uh-huh. And I think like what's also really cool about this book, that you don't see a lot of Holocaust books that I honestly expected. Um, you, you, you see the liberation. Um, and honestly, I was like kind of a little bit confused when I was reading it because I, I was hearing about the bombings that were going into these bunkers and I was like, okay, like the allies are here, but yet I'm halfway through the book. Like what? And, um, you kind of expect the book to end and he's liberated and the book still is not ended yet. And you're like kind of confused because that's usually not the trend of typical Holocaust, um, literature. And it's super cool because I'd say a third, maybe even like three fifths of the book, um, is, is written, um, is written like after, after the war and after the Holocaust. And I think that's really cool because and that's such an important part of, yeah, you and know, it shows how like, about the war, but we never talk about, okay, what happens now? How do we build back after the Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and how do you deal with the memory and how do the generations deal with memory? Yeah. And I think like, what was uh, important yeah, to yeah. me is to contrast the life of a 17-year-old in Slovakia and then in a concentration camp with the life of their grandson, who's 17-year-old, who has different things on their mind, uh, mainly girls, and sort of the memory of, of the Holocaust and sort of their family story in it is, is something completely different. And sort of that, that bonding of a grandfather and a grandson and how they sort of sort of take that trip together, metaphorically and physically, um, and sort of live their life in the shadow, the overbearing shadow of memory. And this is something that is part yeah. of the life of all of these survivors' families. Yeah, yeah, and it shows how, like, the Holocaust doesn't end when the Allies come. The Holocaust, honestly, like, mentally never really ends. And that might not even be the worst thing, because um, you can bring it to light throughout all generations. Um, yeah, so I that guess, will never happen again. Yeah, and if it reference to Slaughterhouse Five, I guess like it, the t time is not fixed. It, it's actually like continuous, um, and it doesn't. The mem if you keep a memory um, alive, it should be alive at all times, and that allows you. Um, I guess this is not applicable to Kurt Vonnegut, but to prevent certain events um, in the future. Yeah. And I, I mean, for him specifically, he managed to separate himself from his difficult memories for most of his life. And he built an amazing family and an amazing business and an amazing community. But towards um, the end of his life, he was, he was hit with guilt, with memories, with nightmares, with, I mean, there were, there were months where he would not be able to, to sleep for more than an hour and wow. he would wake up and he would call me and he would sort of, he would be sweating and he would sort of project himself into situations, into some of the uh, events that actually happened in the book where he couldn't control. He was overwhelmed with emotion and, and with memories and with fears and with, with, with fear uh, of them coming to get him, of, of, of him, of, of people coming to take him away, take his family away, take his uh, property and take his, his home away. So this was always suppressed inside him. There's no way you can uh, graduate uh, from, from this sequence of events and be able to completely, I mean, push it away. It's, it's, it's always there and it's, it's going to catch up with you. And, and it did with him in the last years of his life. Yeah. 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 Well, it must be um, sure. So um, we've gone over the whole book. It's been a long time, but we I'm are going to so separate. I'm so happy you read it, and I'm so happy you sort of dedicated the time and <laughs> and really thought long and hard uh, on some of these aspects that we discussed. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any finishing thoughts before we wrap up? Um, the, the I guys? hope that as many young people as you are will take the time and immerse themselves um, in reading the book, I hope that many of them ask questions, uh, deepen their knowledge and research and, and reading. There's so many great uh, stories about the Holocaust, about the period, stories of bravery, stories of um, other types of stories. I mean, I think it's going to be extremely important for people to familiarize themselves with history because it's our responsibility to make sure that 
this aspect of history doesn't repeat itself. History always repeats itself, but there's some elements of history we need to make sure don't happen again. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, I think that's a great way of wrapping up. Um, yeah. Oz, do you have any finishing comments before we wrap up? No. I think we hit on everything that we want to and more. So. Yeah. For sure. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys for watching. Um, thank you. For the end. I believe this is episode five. Um, episode five in our first yeah. book review. First book review. Um, yeah, please subscribe, like. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. <laughs>